All right, greetings everyone. Welcome to the fourth part of the video for section 6.1, uh, continuing our study of the graphs of sine and cosine functions and looking at transformations of those functions. Okay, so we talked about in the previous video how in the general forms for both sine and cosine functions, so the f of t equals a times sine of b t plus k, and then the f of t equals a times cosine of b t plus k. We talked about how the value for b in both of those is not the period of the function. And I will re reiterate that more because students often will say that's the period. It is not the period. That can help us find the period of the function. So recall that the formula for finding the period using that value for b is that the period is given by 2 pi divided by b. OK, so if we look at the two examples we have over here to the left, in the first one, we see that the value of b is 2. and the second one, we see that it's pi over 4. So we can use that information to find the periods now. So for the first one, we'll do 2 pi divided by the value of b, which is 2. Here, the 2s will cancel out. And we're just left with pi being the period there. And for the second one now, we're going to do the period is equal to 2 pi divided by, now we have a pi over 4. So now we have something where we're dividing with fractions. And so we can take and make that 2 pi, 2 pi over 1. We're dividing by pi over 4. So when we divide with fractions, we keep the first one as 2 pi over 1. Then we flip, or we change uh, division and multiplication. Then we flip the second fraction. So this becomes 2 pi over 1 times 4 over pi. Here we can cancel out the pi's. Multiply straight across. 2 times 4 would give us 8. On the bottom, we just have 1. So 8 over 1 just gives us 8 is the period of this function. Now, notice in this case, for that second function, g of t, the period that we came up with actually does not contain a pi in it, right? It's just 8, uh, which is OK. We can have a period of a function that is just a nice round whole number. All right, we're going to continue studying that second function, and we're going to look at graphing it now. And when we go to graph a function like this, uh, before we even start plotting points or anything like that, we're going to identify some of the important information. So for example, we just figured out with this function that the period, because the value for b is pi over 4, that the period was 8. Okay. We can also, using that form, that general form, g of t, equals a times cosine of b t plus k. We can see that the value for k, which relates to the midline, we can see that that value is negative 1. And then the last thing we can identify is the amplitude, or the value for a which notice with this function, that is a negative 2 that's in the place of a there. And we'll come back to what the negative sign means, but for now we'll just pay attention to the fact that the amplitude there is 2. Okay. And now we can go about uh, graphing this function on the provided axes. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight where the vertical and horizontal axes are. So there's the vertical axis there. Here's our horizontal axis. OK. And I'm going to do some labels here for 
the values on those, so I'm not going to count by ones this way here. So this will be negative one. Here will be negative two, negative three, negative four. And we'll count the same way up. Okay. And the first thing I'm going to do when I go to graph a function like this is mark where the midline is. So based on what we see in the information wrote down, the midline for this function is at negative one. So that means we have a horizontal line going through negative one on the, on the uh, vertical axis. So this dotted line I'm drawing right here, that's going to be our midline. And we know that our amplitude is two, so the function is going to oscillate two units above and below that. And then we're also going to talk about then the next piece would be the period, how to use the period here. Now, you could, for every function that you have to graph like this one, count by ones along the horizontal axis. This is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, and go on and so on and so forth. And just try to fit the function as need be based on its period. Uh, but I like to take a little different approach with it. And here's the approach that I take. If you recall with the cosine function, okay, the basic shape of the cosine function without any transformations looked like this. And I know in a basic um, cosine function, this value here was at zero and this last one here was at two pi. But I want you to notice that within that um, shape there, we have the starting point, and then we have one, two, three, four additional points, important points that we've marked out there, that are evenly spaced out throughout the period between zero and two pi, right? So see those, those four points after the initial one. So what I like to do, and I'm trying to draw the function or the graph of a trig function like this, is take the period here, that eight, divided by four, since there were those four important points. And in this case, that gives me two, which then tells me I should have one of those important points every two units because they're being uh, spaced out evenly. And I'll use that to help me uh, mark my horizontal axis here. So if I start at zero, which I know is where my first point will be, I know the next one will be at two, then at four, then at six, and then finally at eight. Okay. And hopefully you'll see in a minute why that's so, why that's helpful for us. All right, the last thing is figuring out where to start. And that's based on two things. Number one, we see that we're graphing a cosine function here, which we know a cosine function starts off the midline. Okay, so we're either gonna start above or below our midline. And then we're gonna oscillate two units above or below that. And then the next important piece of information is this negative sign. So notice on the basic cosine function I drew here, that function started above the midline when it wasn't transformed. But if you recall from pre-calc one or whichever course you took before this one, that negative sign here tells us that this function has been reflected across the horizontal axis, which means we're actually gonna start below the midline. And because our amplitude is two, we're gonna start two units below the midline. So that tells me here in my picture, instead of starting at negative one, I'm gonna start two units below that here at negative three. And then again, I use that idea that after the initial point, there's four important points spaced out evenly. So the next one I see will be on the midline. So that's this one. And then we'll go two units up above the midline to correspond to this point. Back down to the midline, correspond to this point. And then we'll go two units below the midline here to correspond to this point. And if I connect those dots, see now we've got a single period of a cosine function 
uh, that's been reflected and shifted. Okay, and we could continue on from there, right, and draw more points if we wanted to, although we don't have to, but I will anyways, and so we could have another period looking like that. All right, sweet. Um, all right, let's work on this question then. Here we're asked to write an equation for a sine graph that has an amplitude of three, a period of two, and a midline at y equals one. So here, because we're told that we're writing the equation of a sine graph, then we know we're gonna use the general form for a transformed sine equation, which would be the g of t equals a times sine of bt plus k. And just like the one we just did, we wanna identify all the important information before we start writing the equation. So first the value for A, well, we know that comes from the amplitude and we're told here that the amplitude is three, so we know that. Uh, they tell us the period and I'll come back to that. They also tell us that the midline is at Y equals one, which is gonna tell us that the value for K there is one. And now we need to find the value for B. And be careful, again, the value for B is not two, right? Even though the period is two, that's not the value for B. And recall that we had that formula just a second ago, that the period was equal to two pi over B. And would you agree with me that I could rewrite this formula as B equals two pi over P, and that would be the same thing? Hmm, let's think about that. Can we switch the two things in the division rule there? Well, notice if we do eight divided by four, and this might seem a little off track, but I promise it's related. Eight divided by four gives us two, but that's also true because eight divided by two gives us four, right? So switching these two places of these two things don't change, didn't change. Um, the truthness, truthiness, we'll say truthiness of that equation, right? So it's the same thing here. The P and the B can switch places. So that now gives us a formula for finding B. And we have the period, which says to do two pi divided by the value for B, or sorry, the value of the period. So if we do that here, we have two pi divided by our period, which is two. Here the twos cancel out and we're just left with pi. So the value for B is pi. And now we can go ahead and write our equation then. So we will have G of T equals the value for A, which is three times sine of the value for B, which we came out as without as pi, plus the value for K, which is one. And there's our formula. All right, thank you all for watching. That's it for now.